So let's uh, go through this. Uh, I'll show you a couple of slides here, um, give you some disclosures. Um, this work is funded by the NIH, some internal funding. Um, I have unvalued equity uh, in a startup. Uh, I run a focused research organization outside of my academic institution. I use some technologies we'll talk about at the end. Um, the real disclosures of this talk, uh, I don't consider myself an AI enthusiast nor an expert. Uh, my personal beliefs, which I think are the most important, I think AI is still continually underhyped and underdiscussed. Um, I think that uh, narratives about physicians being replaced or AI bringing about the end of society are probably overhyped. Um, and I think the impact of AI on our society will be both jarring and imperceptible at the same time. This is a common picture, a common question that we get, uh, is AI going to replace your doctor? Um, and we get these reactionary takes about uh, new technology. So hopefully over the next 13 minutes and 56 seconds, we'll sort through all of this and uh, give you some answers you can take home to your next dinner party. Um, we'll explain why uh, the hype around artificial intelligence and machine learning has intensified over the last few years. Uh, describe an opportunity to use some of the data that we love from the operating room to improve surgery and how we approach the de deployment of these systems in the operating room and show a couple other use cases that I think will resonate with this group. Um, just to go over some common terminology, so we're all on uh, level ground here. Um, in general, artificial intelligence refers to both a phenomenon and a family. Uh, intelligence, uh, you know, generally speaking, is considered to meet the standard when it mimics human performance. Um, there's both weak or narrow artificial intelligence that works across a specific data set or domain versus strong or general artificial intelligence which might work across multiple domains or across a variety of human performance characteristics. Um, it's important to break out generative artificial intelligence here, which is where the outputs of an AI system will actually be uh, of a different data format. So for example, rather than having an output as a prediction or a classification, the AI system itself will give you text or an image or audio or video. Um, machine learning generally refers to systems that can improve without explicit instruction, obviously over time or as they accrue more data. Um, there are both neural networks and non-neural networks. Um, we're going to skip some of this stuff because it's not as pertinent for this audience. Um, but I do think we should talk briefly about four ingredients that have led to the hype here. Um, the first is the mobile revolution. I think in 2023, it's easy to forget that there was a time when we didn't all have cell phones. There was a time when we didn't have six or seven billion cell phones in the world. We weren't accruing uh, petabytes of data, um, that these devices didn't all have cameras in them. Um, the second ingredient is a hardware revolution that's been uh, both progressing and accelerating over uh, the last 10 years, um, a, a data storage and data availability uh, revolution, um, and a combination of novel algorithms that uh, have come online over the last um, really five years or so. Um, meanwhile, in medicine, we're still confronted by screens like this. Uh, it doesn't seem like much has changed. This workflow would be familiar to anyone who's practiced medicine in the last 20 years. There's some uh, flow sheets, there's some orders, maybe it's typed instead of text, uh, you know, written by hand, but otherwise it's all the same. Um, most of the, the data that we work with in medicine uh, is this unstructured, unlabeled or sparsely labeled data, right? So these big blocks of text, laboratory values, EKG data, uh, radiographic images, and we spend many hours of our lives transforming this data into nice Excel spreadsheets of this type of structured labeled data. The fundamental reason why AI has made no impact on medicine until now is because it's never had the ability to ingest the type of data on the left. And it's always required data that simply doesn't exist. We don't have these spreadsheets unless we create them ourselves. So this is in essence, to summarize the deep learning revolution in AI and machine learning, is the creation of these systems that can take massive amounts of unstructured and unlabeled data and generate meaningful outputs from those uh, inputs. And this is a major focus area uh, of many billions of dollars in technology, both in the US federal government budget, as well as in the private sector. Um, so how can we actually use this to improve neurosurgical outcomes today? Now that I've convinced you that people are spending billions of dollars on this uh, across many other fields. Um, my, my work mostly focuses on uh, the use of technologies uh, that uh, stem from computer vision, which is in general methods that teach 
com computational systems to see images uh, and to report most commonly either classifications or predictions from an input image. So an example of this uh, going back to uh, beyond uh, to 20, 2010 and beyond uh, is uh, the creation of this ImageNet data set, uh, which is a series of categories of images might be, uh, you know, cats, dogs, cars, planes, et cetera. Um, and then algorithms are asked to categorize uh, these images and uh, their performance is reported. And since about 2015, these algorithms have become better than people uh, at identifying the contents of these images. Uh, so we've already achieved superhuman performance in this domain. Um, and that's uh, classification, detecting objects, instant segmentation, drawing these nice lines around uh, the specific instances of interest, and semantic segmentation where each object is identified within a scene. Um, so these are um, important predicate tasks for a lot of uh, the things that we're going to talk about. Uh, this is a, a task that's ubiquitous within medical imaging. You can think about drawing the boundaries around a tumor in radiology, um, identifying even uh, signals on uh, an echocardiogram, for example, is uh, common. Uh, but it, it, image interpretation is a huge part of many medical fields. It's a huge part of surgery. This is an example of our operating rooms. We're staring at pictures, uh, performing surgery on cameras. Uh, you might imagine it could be useful to have an automated system that can tell you what you're looking at or what might be even around the corner. Um, so our approach has been to move through this in a few stages. Um, the first to ask, is there even any there there? Is there any point in studying surgical video whatsoever? Um, then, okay, maybe there's some value. Can we capture and process the data? Can we develop simplistic quantitative measures and then rudimentary machine learning systems? And lastly, can we actually develop integrated advanced systems that can watch surgery and provide quantitative and qualitative assessments of performance? So a lot of the early work in this comes from general and bariatric surgery, uh, where they showed uh, videos of surgeons performing laparoscopic uh, gastric bypass surgery to other experts and asked them to grade the surgeons uh, and found that the grade of the surgeon in the eyes of their peers was associated with a risk-adjusted complication rate and with complications we really care about, things like return to the operating room, death, technical complications, obstruction, infection, et cetera. So in sum, this body of work shows us that we can watch surgical video, create meaningful predictions as humans, as human experts, uh, of how a patient is going to do based on watching that video. And I think this is something we all know intuitively. So then we sat down and we said, okay, well, uh, let's go and do this ourselves. Um, so the first step is to create a video data set. Uh, so we have uh, an association with North American uh, Skull Base Society run a uh, cadaveric training model for uh, carotid artery injury over uh, the last five years or so. Uh, we saved a bunch of these videos, uh, published them, identified the instruments in, in them and have exploited this data set for machine learning applications. This is something you can go freely download uh, and view. Um, we can create these nice tool presence maps that show you where instruments were in the scene, how long they spent there. Um, and we can show in pilot analysis that uh, when you know how someone moves an instrument, you know far more about them than how many years they've been in practice. You have a far more meaningful metric than whether they're a nurse, surgeon, or ENT, or an attending, or a resident, or how many times they've operated on this particular case or complication. Um, that's not surprising to anyone who's ever watched anyone else operate. Um, so then we did something else. Um, we looked at this model of uh, bleeding carotid, uh, and we limited it to just the first minute of the video. We said, if I give you a minute of video, can you as an expert tell me if this person's gonna successfully control this hemorrhage or not? We showed this to four experts. The experts agreed on 79 out of 80 predictions, but they weren't right very often. They're right about 70% of the time, chance is 50-50. Um, so then uh, we showed the same first minute of the videos only to a neural network, uh, and it was able to at least match, if not exceed, human expert performance, and it was also far more accurate at predicting blood loss by the surgeons during this. So uh, in summary, you can give neural networks very small amounts of video, and they can give back to you meaningful assessments of performance that are at least at the human level. So uh, a lot of the work that we're doing right now focuses on developing uh, integrated systems that can do more than just give you one prediction of one kind or another, like is someone going to succeed or fail at stopping bleeding from a carotid, uh, but provide a whole host of predictions. Um, how well is someone suturing? How well is someone performing a tumor resection or a microdiscectomy? Um, what is the uh, sort of skill assessment in this particular phase? And this is some work that was uh, recently published. Um, so this is our, our core sort of mission or call to action is to transform surgery from an art into a science. 
Um, we've created a focused research organization to develop the infrastructure and tools for surgical video research. Um, this is an active opportunity for collaboration. The goal of this organization is to take surgical videos and take expert knowledge and use this to fundamentally change the way that we train and the way that we share all of the things that we've learned. As an example, in this room, at least earlier today, we had uh, probably more than a thousand years of neurosurgical expertise. Uh, we had more neurosurgeons in this room than in many countries in the world. And we have no way of diffusing that and disseminating that knowledge. Um, this is a critical global health priority, and that's why this organization is founded. Five billion people on earth don't have access to safe surgery, uh, and more than four million people a year die within 30 days of surgery. Makes surgery the third leading cause of death. More people die within 30 days of surgery than from lung cancer and diabetes put together. Those are big numbers. They really matter. And the foundational work that we hope to do here would work with any variety of surgery, any modality. Um, but of course, we want to start with the things that we care the most about. This isn't the only thing that's going on in AI and ML. So I want to take a couple minutes at the end to talk about some of the other exciting things that are happening. Um, Viz.ai is an interesting uh, company that many of you are aware of if you also perform cerebrovascular care. Um, they've sought to attack this problem of uh, speeding up the time to radiology read and uh, stroke team activation or identification of life-threatening uh, intracranial hemorrhage like subdural, epidural hematoma. Um, they also have modules for pulmonary embolism. Um, so they essentially push out that notification after they automatically detect the pathology to an entire team to activate them more rapidly than a radiologist could or to prioritize their studies for interpretation. This is important because it illustrates a way that we're teaming up humans with artificial intelligence methods. We still don't know the best way to do this. It's controversial whether humans should even be involved in the interpretation of these studies at all, um, or in what sequence we should read these images. Um, my personal belief is uh, we should be pretty humble about including these automated systems and certainly humble about replacing people with these systems because their failure modes are poorly understood. Um, but there's this is an active area of research and controversy. Um, if you're performing spine cases, particularly in deformity, um, there are interesting new planning tools that can allow you to predict the results of various osteotomies that are performed. Um, this is a, a technology platform that's since been purchased by Medtronic and integrated in their robotic system. So you can say, hey, I'm going to go do a PSO or multi-level SPOs. Um, what correction am I going to get? What should I do at what level? What type of inner bodies should I put? Um, so these are interesting technologies. They'll then provide you with pre-bent rods. Um, so you get intraoperative feedback about whether or not your correction actually met your pre-planned goals. Um, so these are all uh, examples of how we're integrating uh, these artificial intelligence methods into devices that are coming into the operating room, into our surgical plans and into our performance assessments. Um, lastly, I think talking about the uh, advent of digital pathology is certainly uh, something that's very interesting in this group. What if you could receive pathology information from the operating room itself um, and receive a tumor margin assessment from your intraoperative specimens in near real time in a few minutes, um, or potentially even in vivo uh, using different technologies. So this is uh, stuff that is going to be coming to an operating room, and many of these are commercially available products uh, that you can actually buy today. Um, we've all heard a lot about ChatGPT, um, and no uh, talk on AI could probably get me out of the door without saying something about generative uh, pre-trained transformer models. Um, in essence, uh, this is uh, probably what in the public conception has sparked uh, a lot of the changes in attitudes towards artificial intelligence. Again, this is a subset of generative AI, which as we talked about from uh, the introduction slide, generates text rather than making an assessment about the input data. So you give it some text, it gives you some text back or some computer code um, or even some images. Um, and these are uh, potentially powerful. Uh, an example of this in the clinic, um, these models can ingest some audio. So it's a waveform tracing and report back to you some text. Maybe they'll give you back your operative note. Uh, maybe they'll give you back your uh, history and physical exam without you having to sit down at a keyboard. That's at least the promise of this technology. Um, a lot of this is still um, in the early goings, but this is where ambient audio recording, which is a product that's available from Dragon, uh, a lot of these areas are going. Um, this is a paper that we wrote about five years ago, um, predicting readmissions after uh, craniotomy for malignant brain tumors. 
but now we have AI doctors who will do the same thing that we've been able to do for the last five years. Um, in all fairness, this is really a lovely uh, set of work uh, from Eric Orman, who's at NYU. Um, the power of the, uh, these large language models for predictions actually doesn't have anything to do with their ability to predict readmission or mortality better. It's the fact that this is an underlying model that can perform many different tasks, um, such as imputing uh, comorbidities, predicting whether your insurance claim is going to be denied or how long your patient's going to stay in the hospital from the same underlying model. Um, and the use cases for this are many and varied, whereas unfortunately, my paper for five years ago can only tell you one thing and using national and patient sample database uh, data at that. So um, I think there's good reason uh, to be interested in this area and also to be concerned about it and to understand its limits and its risks. Um, so I'm going to I'm going to pause uh, here, uh, just talk about, uh, you know, some of the things that we've been doing. Uh, we have a meeting if this is an, a topic area that's interesting for you coming up in October. Um, in California. So I would invite anyone who's here uh, to come and attend that. Uh, I think it'll be a great interaction between both neurosurgeons and uh, folks in the technology and venture and computer science space. So thanks so much.